Good afternoon, Grandview. It is Wednesday, and it's Wednesday in the Word time. Just a few announcements for you today before we roll into the scriptures together. First one I want to remind you about is this. is This Sunday is our mid-year business meeting. Now, look, we only have two each year, okay? Two meetings all year. We have our mid-year meeting and then our beginning year meeting. And so the opportunity we have this year is we have some uh, a major uh, announcement in front of you, a major um, need in front of you this year on our mid-year meeting. So please be there to hear about that announcement. We've also got some other cool things coming up on the 20th. We have our chili cook-off. Really excited about the opportunity to be a part of that. And I'm just going to prove that my chili is the best. So chance for you to sign up to be a part of that. Uh, Also, some other things coming up. We have, uh, don't forget about your 40-day devotion as you prepare for uh, Easter. Also, uh, on April the 2nd, we will be having our men's breakfast again, men's breakfast part two. I want to invite you to be a part of that. Also, look for some other cool things coming out in April. Uh, some other announcements about ministry we'll be doing April, May, June, and even July. And so just a lot of cool things going on now that life is kind of going back to normal. Uh, a lot of big things going on, so we want to get those out to you. And so at this moment, let's pray, and then we'll dive into the Word together. Uh, Father God, we thank you for the opportunity today to gather. God, uh, whether it be in body or in spirit, Father, when we unite as brothers and sisters in Christ for uh, the purpose of worship and praise and study, God, you are glorified. And so, Father, I pray today as we look at Hosea chapter 7, Lord, that we would be reminded of your love for us, God, that we be reminded of the need for correction, uh, God, that we be reminded, Father, that, uh, Lord, your word is true, God, your word is beneficial, God, and your word brings about change in our lives. And so, God, we pray right now, uh, Lord, for this time together. We thank you for all your love for us. We thank you for Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, Lord, the one who paid the price that we couldn't pay. Thank you so much, Jesus, for doing that for us. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Well, today, as we jump into chapter 7, we're going to see just a little bit of something different. We're actually going to start back in verse 11 of chapter 6, because those two are kind of together. And and today, we're going to continue this process of uh, God laying down some, uh, some specific sin. And one of the things that we've seen throughout this study in the book of Hosea is that God is constantly reminding them, look, this is where you fell short. This is where you fell short. And it's not because he is trying to punish them. He will punish. And it's not to bring shame to them, but it's for this purpose. So that he can say to them, look, these are your sins exposed. Now you know what they are. Repent and come back. Repent and return to me. And so that's what we looked at in chapter 6, this this idea of we will come back to the Lord. And and as we get into chapter 7, we're going to see some social uh, sins that have been committed uh, by the people. And I think it's fitting because we'll walk into some of that in the next couple of weeks uh, in our Sunday morning time. And so here we go directly into chapter 7. Again, actually, verse 11 of chapter 6, then into chapter 7. It says this, For you also, O Judah, a harvest is appointed. When I restore the fortunes of my people, when I heal Israel, the iniquity of Ephraim is revealed. And the evil deeds of Samaria, for they deal falsely, the thief breaks in, and the bandits raid outside. So as we look into that idea, what we see here is this is God had desired, God's want was to restore the people. He says, for you, O Judah, a harvest is appointed when I restore the fortunes of my people. It was God's desire to restore his people. He wanted to return them back to to the blessings he had given. He wanted to make them a great nation. He wanted to do these things. He said, I want to restore you when I restore. The beautiful part of this is what it means is that eventually the people will be restored. But we know that restoration, when it comes to our relationship with the Father, only happens through repentance. And so we see this already is that they've, God is saying to them, listen, I have done this. I am going to do this for you. I'm going to restore you when you're ready. Well, the great thing about it is that we understand that as truth, that God wants relationship with us. He wants to restore us. But see, so far, every time that, that he would do that, every time he would begin to restore them or do things to bring them back to restoration, their sin nature would just continue to overflow. That they would continue to show these things. And what we see is this. It says, the evil deeds, it says, iniquity of Ephraim is revealed in the evil deeds of Samaria, for they deal falsely. The thief breaks in and the bandit raids outside. What we see is that what was happening in that nation 
was not just uh, just what was going on inside. It was also that they were uh, having sin come in from the outside. So we see this this thing for the whole nation. It's not just individual sin. It's a national sin. But national sin only comes from consistent individual sin. I know it's kind of crazy to talk about, but understand that the sin of our nation, and I know we're talking about Israel here, but the sin of our nation doesn't just happen because, boom, the nation sins. It's individuals and in, 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 in evil in our own country that spreads throughout. So... I know it's a little tricky to understand, but if you need, if you have questions about it, feel free to ask later. Uh, verse 2 says this, But they do not consider that I remember all their evil. Now their deeds surround them. They are before my face. See, this is funny. The Israelites had hoped that God wouldn't see their sin. Uh, this almost brings us back to the garden, right, where Adam and Eve committed the first sin, and Adam and Eve go and hide, right? And it's like, oh, maybe God won't know. Maybe God won't know. We need to understand that all of our sin is exposed to God, that God is, we can't hide things from him, that all of our sin are apparent to him. And what we see is this, he says, I, they, do, they don't consider, they think that I won't remember it. See, these are unrepentant sins. God remembers these things. God holds these records against them. It says, now their deeds surround me. And what's crazy about it is it says that they're, they're in my face. They're before my face. It's almost like they're sin. Because remember, these are unrepentant, rampant, continuous lifestyle sins. They're directly in his face. And God can see, cannot see anything but their sin. Man, that's hard. That's what God sees. It's constantly before him because there's no repentance. And with no repentance, there's no forgiveness. And so God is saying, look, their sin is ever in my face. It's almost like not just that they're doing it, but they're doing it to throw it in his face. Because remember, they, they're dwelling on this idea that they're his people. But see, they've fallen from him. It almost takes us back into where Paul says, should we just continue to sin so that grace will abound? That's in Romans. So we, should we can just keep doing things because God's going to forgive us? Almost the mentality of the Israelites at this point is like, we're God's chosen people. We can do whatever we want to. Let's be reminded again that Jesus says that the ones who love me are the ones who obey me. It's vital for us to see that. And then verse 3 says this, By their evil they make the king glad and the princes by their treachery. What's interesting about this is the political leaders of Israel were thankful that the people were okay with evil. Because the more that the people were okay with it, the more evil the leaders could do. Now, look, this is huge right now. Just I know we're talking about Israel, but this is huge application for us right now. The more we continue to be okay with evil, the more evil will happen. The more comfortable we get with evil, the more evil is going to be prevalent in our land. When we get uncomfortable with evil, that's when things change. Just a reminder to you from Isaiah chapter 5 says this, Woe to those who call evil good. We've got to see that certain things that the world promotes are not good. Certain things the world promotes are evil, and some of us have fallen into the social society gospel that says, well, this, this hurts somebody's feelings, so we need to be kind and loving. Look, you can be kind and loving and confront sin. You can be kind and loving and confront sin. And what is happening is the political leaders of that day were thankful that the people did not care about holiness. Folks, that's the, that's the world we live in right now. That's where we live right now. Verse 4, I, 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 can get, I can stay on verse 3 all day, but I would like to carry on to verse 4. It says this, They are all adulterers. They are like a heated oven whose baker ceases to stir the fire from the kneading of the dough until it's leavened. Now, this verse is a crazy verse, okay? We can all stop and admit for a moment that sin is rampant, right? Sin is rampant. What was happening in the book of Hosea in the time of Israel and time of Judah and Ephraim that's being mentioned here is sin is rampant. But what this says here is they are all wicked. Everybody's wicked. And it, it means both physically and spiritually, their lives are wicked. And he says this, their passions are like a fire, like an oven that doesn't have to be stirred. Now, this may not make sense if you're not used to do, working with fire, but eventually fire begins to die down, right? If it has nothing to consume, it dies down. So if you have a fire oven, you have to sometimes stir the, the ash and stir the, the embers in order to keep the fire going. 
And what he's saying is their passion for sin, their desire for sin, their hunger for sin was so deep, so uh, intense that it didn't have to be stirred. That people didn't have to go, hey, what don't you think about doing this sin? Their minds were constantly focusing on doing evil. So what we get is this idea is that they were, they burned with passion, not for good, but for evil. Oh my goodness, what a, I mean, that God, these are supposed to be God's people, but they had become wicked. And what it says here, when, when I, I love the, the imagery here, it says that whose baker ceases to stir the fire for the kneading of the dough until it's up. It literally means that the fire didn't have to be stoked, that the baker could walk away and spend time continuously kneading the dough until it got to where it was supposed to be. This is a quote I found here today about this passage. It says, The oven was so hot the baker could cease to tend the fire for an entire night, while the dough he had mixed was rising, and then with the fresh tending of the fire in the morning have sufficient heat for baking at the time. He didn't have to deal with it. The the evil in that culture was so prevalent that they just they wanted to do evil. They desired to do evil. Their passions were nothing but evil hello, wake up, folks. That's where we live. That's our day and age right now. Is that people desire to do, people invent new ways to do evil. We have to understand that evil is a real thing that we have to battle against through holy living and Christ-like love. We've got to focus on those things. Okay, I could be there all day again, too. These are two very important verses in this passage, but I'm going to move on to verses 5 through 7 because they kind of run together. It says, On the day of our king, the princes become sick with the heat of wine. He stretched out his hand with mockers, for with hearts like an oven they approach their intrigue. Remember, there's that, that oven thing again. All night their anger smolders, and in the morning it blazes like a flaming fire. All of them are as hot as an oven. Again, there's the oven and the fire. He says, and they devour their rulers. All their kings have fallen, and none of them calls upon me. Now, these verses, verses 5 through 7, the reason they go together, because these are specific political sins that God is addressing in the people of Israel. Okay, What we see is this, is that God is saying these are times that they actually killed their leaders. And it describes the assassination of the leaders and the kings of Israel because of the wickedness of their hearts. See, the political leaders become drunk on power, drunk on sin, drunk on uh, certain uh, certain desires, let's put it that way. And what we see is that at certain times these kings would get to the point where they'd have these festivals that honor these other gods, that they would become so intoxicated that they would be, um, they'd be willing to act on their angers. They'd be willing to act on their passions and actually kill other people. In, in verse 6, it says this, says their hearts were like an oven and they approached their entry. They had these thoughts about, you know, if I could just take out that guy. If I could just take out that king, if I could just take out that ruler or that, that governor or that leader, I could have power. I could take over. And when it says that, it says that would consume them. Literally, we would see this period during Hosea's lifetime that four rulers would be assassinated by their predecessor or by their successors, pardon me. And so we see this happening over and over and over. And Hosea is just repeating these things. He says, look, you have desired these things in your heart to take power by murder. Look, to, to murder anyone is to kill the image of God. And so we, we don't want to do that. That's, that is antithetical of being God's people. And in verse 7 says this, All of them are hot as ovens. They devour their rulers. All the kings have fallen, and none of them calls upon me. This is the direction of Israel. They kept killing their leaders, therefore they had no leader. They were like a ship without a rudder. They were just going everywhere. They would go towards one country for help, another country for help. They would go to Egypt for help. Then they would go to Assyria for help. They were constantly bouncing back and forth with political treaties. And remember, God told them, don't you sign any treaties with any country. And they did it anyway. They would make treaties with other nations because God knew that if they did, that they would cave to the pagan worship. They would no longer worship him because he knew his people. 
They were not people who were strong with their commitment to him. And so what we see is that they were constantly making these choices. They would go, okay, we're going to go align with one, then we're aligned with another. And here's the crazy thing is according to what we know, the people were, were the ones assigning the kings at this point. The people would appoint their kings. And, and this is a quote I saw earlier. This It says, the people hated the leaders that they appointed. The people hated the leaders they appointed. Now, who is who appoints, uh, you know, Scripture says that all leaders have come into power because God's either appointed them or allowed them to be the leader for his purpose, for his desires, for his co- uh, thing to be accomplished. And they would hate who was in charge. They become so blinded that they didn't even realize these kings were kings they had empowered and they were killing them. See, what we saw is that they were continuing to to not understand that God was supposed to be their ruler. If you remember back when they appointed the first king, which was King Saul, God said, I want to be your king. And they were like, "But, but we want our God. We want a king. We want a king. Just like everybody else has got one. God says, I'm your king. And see, they failed to catch that even after the covenant had been passed. After they'd agreed to surrender to God as their ultimate ruler, they were still trying to control the situation. It, it's, 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 it's reality. It's what we do even in our world today. Let's move on uh, to verses 8 through 16. And this will kind of be a, uh, I won't tackle it quickly, but I want us to carry through it. Verse 8 says this, Ephraim mixes himself with peoples. Ephraim is a cake not turned. Strangers devour his strength, and he knows it not. Gray hairs are sprinkled upon him, and he knows it not. The pride of Israel testifies to his face, yet they do not return to the Lord their God, nor seek him from all of this. See, Ephraim had mixed pagan nations with, with God's plan. What we see is this, is that they, again, had made matters or made alliances with other countries. They had decided they would do things uh, their own way. And when he says this, that he has turned himself to the peoples, it means that he would go one way, he'd go another way, but he never went to God. The nation never went to God for healing, never went to God for guidance. It was all about themselves. And the crazy thing is, the nations they would run to were nations that openly opposed Yahweh and, of course, listed their God as the chief God. And so we see this come around that they people were beginning to get confused because they would one na- time they'd be connected to another nation, one time they'd be connected to another nation, and this would happen back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And what we see is this. I love how he says this. He says Ephraim is a cake not turned. Now this terminology is very similar to a pancake. And what we see is if you only cook one side of the pancake, the other side doesn't get done or one side gets burnt, right? Uh, that's why you do like a tester pancake. You do one tester, okay, that's a little too much, that burnt, we, we got to do this, do that. What he's saying is this, Ephraim is a cake not turned. Ephraim has not, never come to fruition. Ephraim has been ruined and is just worthless as a people because they've continued to go against God. You don't eat that tester pancake. You don't eat the one that's burnt. You don't eat the one that's not that's not cooked right. And what God is saying is that if you're not going to obey, then you're not going to be the proper way for me to use you. I'm not going to be able to use you. And it's, a, it's, a, it's a strange analogy that God would use breakfast food uh, to explain how his people were. Is that he said, you're just not fully done. Or maybe you're burnt. But you're not measuring up. It's, I love the fact that God brings out pancakes in, in, in his scriptures. Verse 9, though, says, Strangers devour his strength, and he knows it not. Gray hairs are sprinkled upon him, and he knows it not. Now, I'm going to just tell you, this is one of those things that uh, was difficult. Because what he's saying is gray hairs. Oop, this side, I forget the camera's backwards. Gray hairs are a sign of, of aging and a sign that you're not as strong as you used to be. He's saying to, to Ephraim, you think you're as strong as you used to be, but you're not anymore. Isn't that crazy that you know sometimes the older you get, you, you weaken a little bit? Have you ever been in that place where you thought you were still as strong as you used to be? And then you find out, you know, it's maybe doing yard work. Well, I used to be able to do yard work for hours and hours and hours. And then you do yard work one day for like half an hour and your back hurts and your knee hurts and your head hurts and, and your elbow hurts and places you didn't know how you had hurt. 
This is God is saying, you're not as strong as you used to be. He said, Ephraim, not only are you physically not as strong as you used to be, because they used to have an amazing army. But he's also saying you're not as spiritually strong as you used to be. See, that's, that's important for us to see. He says, your strength, the, the strangers devour your strength and you know it not. You remember when uh, Samson, it was Samson and Delilah, right? Samson finally told Delilah the secret to his strength and she cut his hair. And then she's like, Samson, the Philistines are here. And he jumps up thinking, I've got this. And then they take him captive. See, sometimes we're not as strong as we think we are. And we need to, to grow in strength. We need to grow in wisdom to face some of the things that are coming at us. And then we get in verse 10. It says, The pride of Israel testifies to his face, yet they do not return to the Lord their God, nor seek him for all of this. See, despite the fact that Israel was weakened, and, and they knew it, that's why they kept running to all these other countries. That's why they kept going to everyone else. But they had too much pride. They wouldn't go to God. Now, the question is this. Would they not go to God because they thought that they didn't need him? Or is it they didn't go to God because they were ashamed? Well, what we see here in verse 10, it says their pride. That they thought, well, we're too good to do this. Look, you're never too good to go to God and you're never too bad to go to God. He can fix it either way. All right, and what we see is this, is they turn from God, they didn't seek God's wisdom, they didn't seek God's plan, they didn't seek his face, they didn't seek his mercy, his grace, his love, anything. They sought his blessing and everybody else is a two. And you can't have but one God. And we got to go to him when we want that. Got to go to him for the healing. Got to go to him to make uh, uh, us wise. We got to go to him to bring us mercy and grace and love and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and self-control. We got to go to him for all things. In the moments of chaos. Oh, in the moments of all life. Verse 11 is an interesting one too, real quickly. Ephraim is like a dove, silly and without sense, calling to Egypt and going to Assyria. What we see is this is that according to the, the ancient world and even according to some people now, that, that bird, the, a dove is a bird known for its silliness and naivety, being caught easily in traps and being uh, easily subdued. And he says this, Ephraim's like a dove. Ephraim's silly and doesn't have a whole lot of sense. Because again, I told you that we go to Egypt and Assyria and Egypt and Syria, and you've probably heard that about four or five times today in this idea, in this sharing time. But what we see is they would go to Egypt to have Egypt help them fight off Assyria. And then they would go to Assyria to help them fight off Egypt. They just couldn't make their minds up. They were silly. They were naive. They would go to Egypt for help against Assyria, and then Egypt would, take, would try to conquer them. Then they would go to Assyria to help them defeat Egypt, and then the Assyria would try to take them over. This, this little silly game going on here is just, you, why don't you just obey what God said and stand on him? Then you won't have to worry about it. Verse 12 says, As they go, I will spread my net. I will bring them down like birds of the heavens. I will discipline them according to the report made to their congregation. What we see is that God is going to have to subdue his people. Because they've gone astray, they've gone nuts, they've gone crazy. And God's like, it's time for me to control you. It's time for me to capture you. It's time for me to, to really bring you back into a place of obedience. Verse 13, woe to them, for they have strayed from me. Now, I didn't read this the way it's written, because it's yelling. It's an exclamation point. God is saying, woe to them, for they've strayed from me. God, in the point, at this point, is yelling to his people, destruction is coming because you have gone against me. And then the end of verse 13, I would redeem them, but they speak lies against me. Again, God wants to redeem them. See, that's the crazy thing about it is even in the midst of our sin and disobedience and rebellion towards God, he wants to redeem us. He doesn't look at us and go, I don't really want them. He looks at us in the midst of all of this and says, I love them. I want to transform them. I want to redeem them and make them mine. And that's what it says. I would love to redeem them. I want them. But they speak lies against me. Now, what does this mean? They speak lies against me. What is this idea here? Is that they continued to run from God. 
They continued to speak lies against him by choosing to go against him, not believing that he was able to redeem them. That's why they would run to all these other gods and run to all these other nations for treaties because they did not believe that he was able. And to declare that God was not able is to really lie against God because we know that Scripture teaches us that our God is able to do more than we could ever hope, dream, or imagine. That our God is able to do anything. And so we see that here is that they said God, God, God saying they're lying about me. Let's let's jump down to these last couple of verses here because I'd like to tackle this uh, so we can uh, jump into chapter eight next week. Uh, verse fourteen through sixteen say this: They do not cry to me from their hearts, but they well upon their beds for grain and wine. They gash themselves. They rebel against me. Now, what God is saying here in verse 14 is they may cry in their beds. They may whine and weep in their beds. uh, Or as I I wrote in my notes here, they may cry out, woe is me, because they don't have the wine and the grain that God had blessed them with previously. But they weren't crying out in repentant state. This was a self-pity that they had had over the miserable condition. You have to remember that God had taken his hand of blessing off them, and so things had gotten difficult. Things had gotten tough because they had not obeyed the covenant. And so as God says to them, uh, get right, all they see is that they don't have the blessings. They don't see that the relationship with God is not present. And so God says, oh, they're going to cry and wail and weep because they don't have what they they're used to but they're not understanding what will bring that back and that is to cry out from their hearts and repentance it says there that they would gash themselves part of this is is part of the pagan ritual of how the, the canaanite rituals of how they would worship their gods at the time they would cut themselves as parts of worship uh bell worshipers would often mourn and cry in hopes that uh that he would show up and give them rain uh, you may recall from uh, 1 Kings 18, uh, that the Baal worshipers, when they were challenged to, to have Baal come down and, uh, and send fire over the altar, that they were, they were cutting themselves, asking him to show up. And so that's what he says, it means here when he says that they, they gash themselves. They're, they're asking the other gods to bless them because Yahweh had stopped because of their disobedience. See, it's God or nothing. That's how God works. You don't get to pick God and another idol, God and another another worship uh, religion. You have to pick God, Yahweh, Jehovah Jireh. You have to pick Him. And you can't have all these other gods as the backup gods. It's a, it's like they, they've got, like God's their starting quarterback and they've got some backups just in case they need him. The reality is that he is chief. He is supreme and no other God no other little G God can measure up because all those things fall at his feet. And verse 15 says this, Although I trained and strengthened their arms, yet they devise evil against me. They return, but not upward. They are like a treacherous bow. Their princes shall fall by the sword because of the insolence of their tongue. This shall be their derision, or derision sorry, in the land of Egypt. We get is this is that God had made them. You have to remember the Israelites were the Hebrews were nobodies, right? This was a small group, a small group of people. Yes, that God had blessed, but they became a massive people. And God had prepared them to be a great army. God had blessed them. God, you have to think about the times that God had led them into battle, and God had allowed them to win these wars and battles. That God had done these things. And now they're preparing to go against God by serving other nations, by serving other gods. And it says this, I love how this comes out. It says a treacherous bow. This idea of treacherous bow means a warped bow, that the bow would not shoot straight, right? If a bow is warped, then it doesn't shoot right. It doesn't shoot straight. It says they've returned. Look, they've gained some people. They've gained some strength, but they're not going to shoot right because they're not right. See, they're not in right relationship with God, so they're not going to accomplish his task. See, when we're, the bow's not right, it misses the mark. What does it mean to miss the mark? Well, Scripture tells us that the word sin means to miss the mark. So we miss the mark of God's holiness, the God's design, and God's perfection. And the beauty of this is God is telling them, look, if you want 
to return, come back. If you want to shoot straight, if you want to accomplish my purpose, come back. But they weren't ready yet. They weren't ready yet. They weren't ready yet to come back to God. They had made decisions to make treaties with other nations. They didn't rely on God. Psalmist writes this, Some trust in chariots, but I will trust in the name of the Lord my God. See, they had trusted in the chariots of Egypt and the, and the warriors of Assyria, but they had not trusted in God. Like We live in a world that tells us that almost everything is okay. That almost anything that your heart desires is okay. Like I, I, don't, I don't know about you, but I don't want to trust in what the world says. I want to trust in the Lord my God. Because he's a mighty warrior. And he never loses a battle. Will you sign up to be on his team? I hope you will. God bless you. Have a great day. Bye-bye.